Hello and welcome to today's presentation on ASNZS 3000, also known as the wiring rules in regards to distribution board requirements and ASNZS 61439. My name is Jamie Goddard and I am the NHP Product Manager for Distribution Panel Boards. In this presentation, we are going to cover what has changed in the wiring rules in regards to distribution boards. This will cover AS NZS 61439. What is this standard? And what are the requirements, such as verification to the standard? How do I know the distribution board is compliant? What to look for? And staying within the scope of the design. AS NZS 3000 requirements. AS NZS 3000 requirements. Amendment 2 was published on the 30th of April, so effectively it was released in May this year. In New South Wales, it was with immediate effect and other Australian states had a delay of six months, so effectively it becomes mandatory for those states on the 1st of November. New Zealand are currently reviewing this standard for release, so you just need to refer to your local regulator for more detail on its effective date. In Amendment 2, it mandates switchboard construction shall, the word shall is important, comply with 3439 or 61439 series of standards. There are some conditions, read clause 2.10.3.2, such as it shall comply if the current rating is greater than 125 amps or the fault level is greater than 10 kA. So, for example, if the distribution board is rated at 160 amps and has a 6k fault level, then it must comply as it meets one of these conditions. If you see note 2, it makes reference to Appendix K, which is an informative section to provide guidance on what is needed to comply. Appendix K out of ASNZS 3000 provides an informative overview of the 61439 requirements. So it acts as a bit of a linking guide to the 61439 series of clauses, which we will discuss further in a minute. You can see here K1 through to K12 has the different parts. What is ASNZS 61439? Why AS NZS 61439? The 3439 series of standards was the standard used for switchgear assemblies up until May 2016. In May 2016, the 61439 series of standards was released. It was a five year transition period of which then, as per the Australian standards, the 3439 series was superseded by the 61439 series. Note that the 3439 series is still referenced in the wiring rules, but it has been superseded, but it has not yet been withdrawn. The 61439 series is more thorough and detailed. It clarifies the specific requirements for testing and verification and removes some of the great areas of interpretation found in the 3439 series. This creates a more level playing field. The new standard aims to clarify legal and financial responsibilities in specification, testing, design and construction between the user and the assembly manufacturer. The 61439 series of standard for low voltage switch gear and control gear assemblies. It consists of eight parts which define requirements to meet different needs. Part O is the general guide to specifying assemblies with general rules in part one. Part two is power switch gear and control gear assemblies. Part three is distribution boards intended to be operated by ordinary persons, also known as DBOs. Part four is for assemblies for construction sites. Part five is assemblies for power distribution in public networks. Part six is bus bar trunking systems. 
by seven for marina camping markets and charging. Today we'll focus on parts two and parts three. So part two, power switch gear and control gear assemblies that we can see here on the left. Part two is designed for installation to areas for authorised persons only. Typical applications, industrial, commercial, and similar where operation by ordinary persons is not intended. It's typically a locked DB or in an authorised area only, such as a switchboard room. NHP offer these in commonly available current ratings of 160, 250, 400, or 630 amp. There's no current limit on the outgoing circuit, and you can specify to have a form of separation. On the right-hand side, we can see part three distribution boards intended to be operated by ordinary persons, or a DBO. So these are typically for use by anybody, a general person, typically unlocked for general access. The current rating cannot exceed 250 amps. That's an INA rating of 250 amps. That's the assembly rating. An outgoing circuit cannot exceed 125 amps. That's the INC rating. And outgoing protective circuits must be suitably to be operated by ordinary persons, such as circuit breakers to the 60898 standard. No form of separation can be specified. If it's needed, it must be the part two. Requirements of AS NZS 61439. The requirements in AS NZS 61439 series includes verification of the assembly. Verification covers two main aspects, design verification and routine verification. There are three different types of design verification, which we'll explain in more detail next. Routine verifications are the final checks that the assembly is done to ensure it's been assembled correctly. The switchgear assembly is required to be design verified. There are three methods available. Tested method. In this method, the distribution board is designed and assembled in the same configuration as the test assembly. Comparison with a reference design is the second method. The distribution panel board is designed in a similar but a different configuration to the tested configuration. When the tested reference designs are more onerous than the design panel board being verified. And the third and final method is by assessment. This requires the correct application of design rules and calculations, including the use of appropriate safety margins. Annex D in 61439, table D, Point one in part one of the 61439 series provides guidance on what method is acceptable depending on the characteristic to be verified. You can see this at the table at the bottom showing 10.2.2, testing is okay for that clause, comparison is not, and assessment is not. So it verifies which method is appropriate depending on what clause being tested. Overview of design verification. Here we can see the full table, D.1, out of AS NZS 61439, Part 1, as referenced in AS NZS 3000, uh, Appendix K 4.3. This shows all the characteristics and actual reference test clauses. They're all sub clauses of clause number 10. There are some slight variations in clause 10, tests. It depends if you're verifying to part one, part two, or part three, for example. Part three has a couple of additional clauses that aren't shown in this table, table D.1. As NHP are the manufacturer for our off-the-shelf Concept panel board range, we've declared ratings for these assemblies. 
to support these ratings, we have supporting declarations of conformity, also known as SDOCs, along with other supporting technical documentation. On this SDOC, you can see across the top is the manufacturer information. Then we have the product code. Then we have the technical ratings. Across the bottom is the compliance section showing what standards the declaration is to. And on the right hand side, we have the full example of an SDOC that's available on our website. Here we have a close up of our SDOC. We'll start with strength of materials and parts under clause 10.2. There are different parts to this. The first one you can see resistance to corrosion 10.2.2 must be tested and you can see on the right hand side the test report and comments. Then there are properties of insulating materials under 10.2.3. There are sub, sub clauses of this thermal stability which is 10.2.3.1. But this is more for insulated enclosures and deemed not required for a test if the enclosure is metallic. Resistance to abnormal heat and fire to internal electric effects, 10.2.3.2, is for applicable more for a glow wire test for internal supports, such as neutral supports, chassis assemblies, covers and barriers. As you can see on the right hand side, NHP have their test reports listed here. Resistance to UV radiation, 10.2.4. So is more for outdoor applications and deemed not required for indoor applications. If you have a product with specific lifting points under 10.2.5, uh, then you would have tests here. But as the concept, the example we see here, doesn't have lifting points. Then there's mechanical impact, 10.2.6. It's been tested. And there are minimum strength requirements for this under part three. Under part three, the minimum for indoor enclosures is IKO5 and outdoor enclosures IKO7. There are also marking requirements to ensure the markings are durable and they show the identification markets and markings and ratings. Durable means it simply can't be a paper label that you can rub off. It needs to be permanent and durable. So here's some more examples of tests under clause 10.3 through to 10.8. I got, won't go through all of them. One of the more important ones on this page is 2, degree of protection of enclosures 10.3. So what environment is the enclosure to be installed in? So it needs to be suitably tested for that rating. Here you can see on the right we have test report for IP42 and IP52. IP water and dust. So you need to protect against both of those, so that determines the, the numerals for the first and the second digit. But you also need to restrict access to live parts with the escutcheon closed. And for DBOs, that requirement is an IP2XC rating. Further down, you can see other tests that are required, but I won't go into too much detail on those in this presentation. Here's an example for the tests under clause 10.9 through to test 10.102. I won't go through all of them, but I'll focus on temperature rise and short circuit. There are two tests shown here that will vary a lot depending on the internal componentry. Temperature rise limits. Probably the most volatile test as the result can change depending on many different factors. Simply adding extra gear will impact this test and may push the tester design out of scope. It's especially important to follow manufacturer's guidelines here to stay within scope to prevent the assembly running over temperature. The other important test here is short circuit withstand. No one wants to see an enclosure exposed to a short circuit beyond what it's been tested to, as we'll see in an upcoming slide. No testing is required if the assembly is below 10K or an upstream device has a let through of 17 kA peak. NHP have completed extensive testing over and above the requirements of this standard. This is to ensure we bring to market the best and safe, 
safest possible products we can bring to market. The short circuit withstand can be expressed different ways, such as ICW is a withstand rating with a time specified. An example would be 10K for 0.1 of a second. ICP is a withstand with no time, so it might be simply just 10KA. Or an ICC rating, such as dependent on an upstream device. So it might be 10K provided there's a, an AE250 MCCB upstream. There are a lot of, of explosive forces under short circuit conditions, so ensuring the assembly is structurally sound before and after is paramount to NHP. On our next slide, a video will pop up. And on this video will be an example of a short circuit test in the test station in Melbourne. This was a NESMA event, National Electrical Switchboard Manufacturers Association, a few years ago, showing the impact of short circuit currents. You can see here there's a roller door on the left. This would normally be closed, but due to this event, it's opened and there was a bit of perspex placed there that's clamped into place. When the test is happening, have a close look at the shock forces pushed onto this window during the test and even the reactions of the people behind it. This can show you how dangerous fault currents can be in the importance of having a tester designed. It's very important to have a switchboard rated for the perspective fault level it was designed to. To pass this test, generally there's a gauze placed in front of the switchboard and nothing's allowed to damage this piece of gauze. In this example, we've got a shirt on a stick or simulating a, a worker. So you can see exactly what happens to him and why it's important to have a, a correctly designed product. The first test you'll see is in real time. And the second test is the same test, but in slow motion. So now a screen will now pop up with the video feed of this test and then after the video we'll continue with the presentation. So that was a bit of an eye-opener, that video, wasn't it? You don't want to be standing in front of a switchboard when things go off, especially if it's not been rated correctly. Now, routine verification, clause 11, ASNZS 61439, or referenced in ASNZS 3000 K12, Appendix K12, defines routine verification as intended to detect faults in materials and workmanship and to ascertain proper functioning of the manufactured assembly. This is made on every assembly during and or after manufacture. Basically confirms the individual switchboard has been assembled correctly and, it's been and the design verifications will hold true. So having a bit of a look over it, um, conducting a, a checklist that NHP do on our switchboards to ensure it's been built as it should be. Well, that didn't sway the best, but we'll move on. Is the assembly compliant and what to look for? It's difficult to tell if the assembly is compliant or not. But some key tells or what to look for in a switchboard, uh, some in good indicators, such as ASNZS 61439 has minimum marking requirements for all switchboards. The label has to be durable with a durable permanent marking and positioned to ensure it is clearly visible. With NHP concept panel boards, this fitting label is to the inside of the door, as you can see on the example here. There are minimum requirements for identification, such as the assembly manufacturer, part number or project number of the board, the manufacturing date code, and to which part of the standard it's built to. There are also two additional requirements if it's built to part three of the assembly standard, the DBO. The INA rating, 
which is the assembly current rating. So it's generally the lowest rating of the main switch or the bus bar or even the neutral bar too. This is the easiest way to tell at face value if the board is complying to 61439. As the label is a requirement of both parts of the standard or it can act as a red flag that the assembly is not complying client if it is missing. Other things could be the escutcheon for DBO is not IP2XC or if it's to part two IP2X. Other things could be the assembly stating a 10K rating but there's only a 3K main switch as most people only look for the bus bar with send rating and not all parts of the assembly. So they're just key things to look for. It's not extensive but it's just the first first look. There are other declared characteristics on top of the markings that are required to be on the assembly such as clause 5 as per AS NZS 61439 or as referenced in AS NZS 3000 the wiring rules appendix K or K.9 tells us the other characteristics that need to be declared. These ratings can be provided via catalogues for off-the-shelf items or included the declaration of conformance or manual supplied with the equipment. Some of these are the UE rating which is the operational voltage, the rated current which we talked about before, the INA, the INC, the rated current of a circuit, the rated diversity factor, or the rated short circuit with stand current and we talked before about the three ways ICW, ICP or ICC. If it's to part three the assembly standard it needs to be declared if it's a type A or a type B so for single phase applications or single phase or multi-pole devices. The current rating of the bus bars, the maximum size of the overcurrent protected device such as it's suitable up to 63 amp MCBs and the rated current of the neutral bar is it fully rated at 250 amp for example. Here's an example of some of the additional declared ratings as shown on the NHP S-Doc. Summary of what to look for in an assembly. To be most comfortable, the product you are purchasing is compliant. What are the key things to look for? To start with, the rating label on the product. Then, does it have an S-Doc supporting documentation. Then is there a tech data sheet with the additional information required? If any of these things are missing, it could place a question mark over the product compliance. How do I stay within the scope of the assembly design? Points to consider that the assembly is within scope. NHP concept panel boards are designed and verified to meet AS NZS 61439. If a user modifies the panel board outside the scope of the NHP design, they are then deemed to be the original manufacturer and they are responsible for compliance to the AS NZS 61439. Also, if a user accepts a panel board without suitable verification, they may be putting their facility and persons at risk and may be liable for any issues that arise. Test certification to ASNZS 3439 may be used for verification purposes to ASNZS 61439, but only if the test methods required are the same, e.g. some certain short circuit tests. Staying within scope, can be difficult to understand, but NHP has produced a handy brochure with information to 61439, which includes some information on staying within scope using the NHP concept panel boards, as you can see on some of the bullet points here. We'll examine some of these examples in the upcoming slides. Staying within scope. So how do you stay within scope? best way is use the same brand of switch gear. Assemblies are tested with one type of switch gear and fitting other brands would generally go outside the scope as 
What hasn't been considered is the short circuit let through energies and temperature rise testing would not have been performed. As a minimum, it would need to be assessed to see if it would be suitable. Much easier just to use the recommended brand inside that assembly. Follow manufacturer's advice and supporting documentation on what is allowed to be added to a, an assembly. Replacing like for like electrical components is allowed. As you can see on the bottom right hand corner of some InScope additions on an NHP panel board. Here are some examples of InScope NHP accessories that are typically have very little heating effect. Running from the, the top left, we've got emergency lighting test kits. So great for controlling single point emergency lighting fittings. External lighting control, time clock, uh, contacted with an on off switch and terminals and wiring diagram to, to go with it. Rain hoods for Concept Premier boards that are mounted outdoors to prevent a build up of water on top. Glam plates, aluminium and brass glam plates, great for uh, being non-ferrous, so stopping eddy currents uh, when you're bringing in multiple cables, large cables in the top or bottom of the enclosure. Surge protection on the bottom left, a circuit protective device, a surge diverter, a loom and labelling to suit, great. Uh, concept isolator, uh, if you need to change the main switch from a, a 160 to a 250 amp rating. You may need to change the handle to a padlockable handle or a public works handle or a special key code. We can do that. Something that's often not considered as an accessory in InScope is uh, due to condensation, um, you need to be careful if, you, if your board is uh, likely to consider uh, condensation due to rapid temperature changes or the environment it's installed in. We do have vents that can be mounted on the side of the enclosure and drains uh, that can be mounted on the bottom. So in the latest version of AS3000, it does make reference to consider these uh, because if your enclosure is maybe IP66, but it may still have an ingress or may produce water due to condensation. So you need to consider these type of accessories. Also for floor mount plinths. There are other devices such as DIN contactors and safety services kits that can be fitted, but there may be limitations depending on, on the rating of the board and its application. So you just need to be careful that it doesn't exceed temperature rise limits and you may need to contact the manufacturer in those cases. Some accessories that may be evaluated that also may fall out is flush mounting as this may affect the heat dissipation of the enclosure. Mold case breakers directly connected to a chassis. Let's say a 250 amp set at two, 250 amp mold case frame set at 250 amp. Uh, the temp rise on this, I've only seen this successfully work up to 200 amps with many manufacturers. So if someone's claiming 250 amp, uh, you may want to double check that. Switch gear with large watt losses in the same assembly has an implication on temperature rise. Uh, so you may need to consider that. And other brands of circuit protection as they have different performances such as what's lost. All these things need to be considered if you're staying in or out of scope of the assembly. If in doubt, contact the manufacturer. Staying within scope, in AS NZS 3000, repairs versus alterations. This is an interesting topic. It's often talked about. And, uh, and we need to be very careful of. As per clause 1.4.8 in the wiring rules, we need to be care a bit careful about the definition of a repair versus an alteration. Definition of a repair, as per 1.4.101, repair or restoring assembly to a safe and sound working condition after deterioration or damage. Appendix K11 also provides guidance on repairs to existing switchboards. It's far easier to replace damaged parts with the same component, but it may not always be possible when repairing older boards. However, an alteration, as per 1.9.3.1, 
If the work you're doing includes modification to the parts of the switchboard, this would be considered an alteration if it's not a repair, as if it's not classed under the definition of repair. If you're doing an alteration, you'll need to bring the switchboard up to the relevant provision of the current standards, which worst case may mean you have to even replace the switchboard. You need to likely engage with the device manufacturer or even the original switchboard manufacturer if you want to consider or conduct alterations so the work can be done and it complies. If the work is deemed a repair, there's a bit more leniency there. When repairing a switchboard, you're allowed to use methods, fixtures and fixings that were applicable when the switchboard was first installed. If the repair includes replacement of device, Appendix K in the wiring rules recommends to follow the substitution guidelines from 61439 for short circuit and temperature and current ratings. So just be careful of what your work you're doing if you're doing it inside a switchboard, if it's a repair and alterations, and what you need to be compliant with to ensure you stay within scope. Useful information. You can see here a, a brochure that we've produced. In this document, it summarises a lot of what was covered today and is available on the NHP website under Industries and Solutions, then Concept Solutions and Applicable Standards. Also in this location are some of the NHP panel board SDOCs. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I hope you found it beneficial and if you'd like to watch it again, a recording will be sent to you via email and will also be uploaded onto the NHP YouTube channel. To find more webinars in this series, simply click in the button into the call to action section on your screen which will take you to our website or visit our YouTube channel. A short survey will also pop up on your screen once the webinar concludes. We'd be grateful if you could take five minutes to provide your feedback. I'm now able to take any questions that you may have or have sent during the presentation. Okay, I've been going through some of the questions and we've had a few, uh, few common ones that, that we're going to answer. Helping me answering the questions today has been a colleague of mine, Jeff Davis, who sits on a few standards committees. Um, do you want to say hello, Jeff? Hello everybody and thanks for joining us on this webinar. Yeah, we've had quite a good attendance of this one. There's been over 700 people which is fantastic. A couple of questions we're going to now answer is uh, some people were saying they couldn't see the video. Uh, it, it did display but uh, when you get sent the link you should be able to view the video. Uh, it's quite, quite a good video showing you uh, what can happen if things go wrong. Another question that we've got here is uh, we received and the question I'll read out and, and Jeff will answer it. It appears that it's not possible for a consulting engineer to visually inspect and confirm compliance of an older 3439 board part one. Existing switchboards to 61439 as the design and testing process appears as it would need to be performed by a switchboard manufacturer in most cases. Do you agree? Okay, this question, with this question, um, there's very little difference between 3439 and 61439. If the original board of three was built to 31439 and all the test certificates are able to be viewed, you can then look at whether they can be assessed to be equivalent or used under 61439. But in most cases, as the complexity of these boards has grown over the years, it would be better that compliance is carried out by a switchboard builder who is intimately involved in the testing requirements and the standard. Thanks for that one, Jeff. We have another question here. Uh, with our vents and drains, or even cable lands, what IP rating are they tested? And and they've fitted correctly, is there any limitation on what boards they can be fitted to? So the vents and drains, I believe, have an IP66 rating, uh, 
which I, I can't confirm, but I'm pretty confident they do. So long as That's they are fitted to an enclosure, I oh, thanks, Jeff. As long as they have that uh, that rating and the enclosure had a, a rating at IP66 or less, then those those vents or drains could be fitted to that enclosure and not impede on the IP rating of the enclosure. Also got a lot of other questions coming in. Um, we might have a, a quick look at uh, some of these. Um, are all the boards type tested or just ones per batch or series? So this is quite a good question. So with the verification purposes, uh, switchboard must be tested as the most onerous design of that of that uh, configuration. Um, so that may be the smaller size, it may be the log larger size, it may be both. Um, so you test one small, one large, depending on what what sort of ratings you're trying to trying to uh, to pass on that test. Temperature rise, a smaller one is going to be going to be tougher. But uh, for IP rating, the largest one will be tougher. So it comes down to to uh, picking out uh, particular sizes of what is going to be the most onerous in the testing for that, that configuration when doing your design verification. Um, OK. So there was another question. When will these stands come to infect in New Zealand? Uh, we mentioned earlier when they come into effect in Australia, in New Zealand, they're currently reviewing all the standards, including the, 20, the 2018 version of the wiring rules. So when they cite those, um, I know they've been doing a big public review in New Zealand over June, July, um, and the results of that are expected to come at any time. So I can't tell you when it's going to come into effect. But, uh, but something's going to be uh, announced, I would say, soon from WorkSafe New Zealand on, on that one. Any other ones in here, Jeff, that you would like to uh, have a go at answering? Oh, there's a uh, lot coming in really, got... really, really quickly. So um, there's a whole bunch of questions around motor control centres. I'd just like to touch on that because I've seen a few now. Um, the motor control centre is a discussion that is a little more in depth that can be gone into today. So what we will do is put together some information and Jamie, I think, and we'll send it out when we send it in further information out after the presentation. But it is a little, little in depth and very dependent on each person's application. So hopefully that yes. will satisfy a few of the people that asked about motor control centres. And we, yeah, we do have a lot of questions coming in, so it's going to be impossible to answer them all. But yes, we will send out a, a sheet after this presentation. Uh, there will be a link initially to the presentation uh, that you can review what we've just gone through. Uh, but following that, um, in a few days or a week, uh, we, we plan to set out a Q&A answering a lot of the questions that have just been coming in now um, that we're getting bombarded with. Um, there's quite a few people on this presentation, so there's quite a few questions coming in. So Jamie, so, there's a question around have distribution boards always required compliance stickers and plates? Well, that's always yes. been the case. Yes, definitely yes. Uh, have Has everyone always been doing it? Not necessarily, uh, but it, it always has been a requirement to the 3439 series or to the 61439. And, and like we said in the presentation, most of the testing between the two standards is, is pretty much the same. Uh, where 61439 has uh, brought or made it more transparent is the consistency of testing uh, between different products and making sure all the manufacturers test in a consistent way. So when you go to purchase a product, and it's rated that you know you're buying, comparing apples with apples on different products. So I guess that's that's the biggest thing that the 61439 has brought about uh, by by coming in. Jamie, I've on that note, yeah. oh, all right. Here oh, goes, sorry, I've just got one other question I'd like to to get out because there's been a few uh, uh, through the list. Um, are all boards type tested or just one per batch? The process of how you construct boards are, is tested, and then that process is applied to boards, every board after that process. 
you are not testing every single board. It's a, a, a quality process of construction to the test that you originally did, and then you construct similar to that original test. Jamie, are you yep. happy with that? that? That's fine. I've got another fairly uh, one that I will answer. Have temperaturized tests actually been conducted? The INA, which is the assembly rating, generally is a tested value. It is usual for a 100 amp, 160 amp switch, a 250 amp chassis, to actually achieve an INA of 160 amp. Yeah, so it would be the weakest link in the assembly. So if the main switch is less than the chassis rating, then the assembly rating would be the INA would be the, the weaker link, which we, in this case would be the 160 amp switch. So on that, I think we'll call it. Um, we will respond to these questions in time, unless Jeff, you've seen another one you want to answer now. Uh, no, we'll, I was just uh, trying to pick up sort of similar questions across yeah. the um, the, the no, huge number of questions that have come in. Yes, there's been been quite a lot. So thank you for your attendance today. Uh, thanks for helping answer these questions, Jeff. Um, we will respond to these questions and, and come back to you and uh, look forward to the link. If you're looking for information on what was covered today, you do have this video also on our website. If you go to uh, solutions and concept panel boards, you'll see a copy of the brochure that was uh, shown in one of the last slides, which covers a lot of the information that, that was uh, presented today. Thanks everybody for your time and, uh, and look forward to our next uh, webinar. Thank you.